Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. Good morning and happy Monday to you. How are you this morning? I am get, I am just right up to the minute of coffee time. There's always news. There's always something happening. So much to share with you. But first, let me log on and say hello and good morning, everybody. Heidi, I see you there. Good afternoon to you. Congratulations on your bingo win. For those of you who didn't join us on Friday night, we had a very fun episode, Fine Art Bingo on Friday. It really was fun. We looked at a lot of artists, some fairly well-known, some not well-known at all, um, but deserve to be better known. So that was a lot of fun going through that together with you and, and playing our game. And congratulations to those winners um, who've been notified. If you had card number four and you weren't notified, let me know. Uh, because that was the winning card. It was a very fun night. Kirsten, great to see you. Happy Monday in Vermont. Robin, happy Monday. Great to see you. The weather's been beautiful for the past couple days. Here too. You know, it is not spring in New England. It is summer in New England. We don't have spring anymore, apparently, or fall for that matter. We go right to the extreme of every season. It's the craziest thing. It got so warm over the weekend. It was just like, it was beach time all of a sudden. And all of those adorable cardigans I bought on Facebook Marketplace, on eBay, I just don't think I'm going to get a chance to wear them because um, there's no in-between weather anymore. We'll see what happens. But I'm happy that it is sunny. I'm happy we're on the kind of upswing with, with cheerful weather. Linda, great to see you. It's going to be stormy, too. You're right. Today we have um, kind of a crazy forecast, possible like extreme tornado-type conditions. You know, when it kicks up, changes quickly. There's all kinds of warnings, maybe for you in your area, too. Be careful, everyone. Beverly, great to see you. Cheryl, great to see you. It's a beautiful day in Maine. Oh, that sounds so good. Marilyn, great to see you in Northwest Indiana. Linda in Massachusetts, Sunny Mass, good to see you. Crystal, I haven't forgot about you. I'm just not pressuring you right now, but I'm coming back for you. Good to see you. April, good afternoon. Great to see you. Linda B from coast to coast, that's right. And across the pond, that's right. We've got lots of buddies on. Oh, Doreen, good to see you. Rainy and thundering in upstate New York. Oh, dear. Anita, hello in London, Ontario. Great to see you, too. Aileen in Toronto. Finally cool and comfortable, huh? Oh, it is a nice change. Dave, I've been wondering where you were. Not that you have to account for yourself. I just missed you. It's good to see you. So much going on here. Um, you know, um, first let me tell you about what I was working on this weekend, and then I'll tell you I got a little bit of news this morning. So um, this weekend I was working on dyeing because I am going to be going away soon to the Cape, and we'll talk about that next week when it gets a little bit closer. So I was working on doing some dyeing. Those aren't going to work. Let me get rid of those. Let's 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 try this again. Um, I put, you know, I didn't realize that the Prim Cottage swatch set was out of stock for a little while. So that is back in stock. I've got a ton of the Prim Cottage, right, which is this lighter palette Prim Cottage garden set. But this weekend I dyed the new set and I already started chopping it up and I saved pieces of each to show you for the time being. This is going to be the new set. Monitor is never good, but the new set is a kind of an art deco set called um, Songs of a Summer Night, right? So this is my favorite ever. You'll have to look at it um, when it gets up on Ribbon Candy Hooking, hopefully later today. But it's, again, more of an art deco set. And I had in mind, like, you know, evenings, like summer evening with some brights, but like mostly dark and moonlight colors. And I named each color after a song, like the, the kind of rusty orange is the Joni Mitchell song, A Case of You. Do you know that song? It is so beautiful. The really rusty one is This Old House. That's one that always makes me cry. Stardust is turquoise. Um, Don't Cry Out Loud. Remember that was that um, Roberta Flack, something like that, right? But I found some Willow Weep for me, some Oldies, Paper Moon. They each have a Green Dolphin Street. They're all songs that I like that I forgot about. Evergreen, the Barbara song. So they each have like special meaning that has to do with their color and it's a collection of songs for a summer night. So that should be out a little bit later, a little bit later today. I've got that dyed up and ready to go. Um, today's episode is going to be on the collection of Barbara Johnson. So we will talk a little bit about her life and her collection. Her hooked rug collection is in this book. She had collections of collections. So there's a lot to know about her. There's a lot of Sotheby's catalogs out there with collections of her stuff. But of course, we are mostly focused on her hooked rugs. Um, we're going to come back to that, but right before I started the show, about 20 minutes before I started the show, I got the most beautiful long email. Um, I don't want to choke myself up, but 
do you remember a couple months ago, um, I ran an episode on Diane Cox, COX, in Penzance in Cornwall, England, and I had figured out by looking online that she had passed away, um, but I didn't have any of the details, and I tried very hard to find the details, and I couldn't. So um, in lieu of having some you know, solid information, I just ran what I thought was the best kind of tribute show I could run for her. Um, and I included a ton of her work. It was on a cocktail night episode. A ton of her work and um, a lot of her favorite artists. I went slides and slides of her favorite artists, the, the people who she really loved, who she felt inspired her work. So let me just remind you, Carol, great to see you. Lynn, Linda Ann, great to see you. Chrissy and Courtney, good, everybody's logging on. That's great. Let me show you really quick as a reminder um, right here. So this is Diane. I literally just took this picture off the internet. It's not a high quality picture. Um, let me come back to that for a minute. This is one of her pieces, right? We talk about her a lot because for me, Diane really represents that split between, let me come back here. Um, and you know, it's funny and it's kind of uncanny because I was thinking about this this weekend this split that is almost um, not even a style split or a generational split, but almost almost a national split in philosophy when it comes to rug making. So without, without making it sound like I think one thing is better than the other thing, I was thinking this weekend because I taught yesterday, I was teaching Amish toothbrush at uh, Madison, right? We're, we're making Amish toothbrush rugs and it was a lot of fun. But it occurred to me while we we're sitting there and chatting and talking about all kinds of things, rug making, I was thinking, you know, it does seem to me like at least in the U.S. for several generations, for several decades, um, there, there has been a school of teaching, and we have said this before, that's kind of like, this is how you do it. You, what, let me watch you do it. Let me watch you shade that in. Let me watch you do that next part. Now your piece is complete. Excellent. Well done. You did it. What piece do you want to do next? And it's been a lot less... Um, historically for us in this country, it's been a lot less about inspiration and personal storytelling and personal mythology and all of that stuff. And I know that designy stuff that's bordering on touchy-feely is not for everybody, but it has been much more common, particularly in England, where Diane Cox is from, um, to be using rug making as a medium, right? Not just show me how to rug hook, show me how to shade, show me how to fill this part in, give me a diagram with the next leaf so I can fill that in good too, and now I'm done, what's my next piece gonna be? It's more, it, from the beginning, the sort of mentality and philosophy has been more like um, seat of the pants, right? Seat of the pants in terms of I'll use this material, I'll use that, I'll use that, I'll use that. Um, and I'm going to make it the way that I want it. So it's just, it's, there's been a difference all along. And for me, Diane, I'm going to come back to her here. Really, her work represented that huge, vast difference that is bigger than an ocean, right? So her son wrote to me this morning, and it was a very emotional and, for me, really um, tearjerker of an email because he said, He's in Penzance here at her studio, and you know he's got a young family. He's going through her stuff, and he said, um, for some reason, this is one of these stars aligning things. He just googled googled his mom, and the video that I did on her that night that we had our cocktail time popped up, and he said it was so surreal to sit in her space in this picture, going through her stuff, kind of. Slowly, it's super sad, super heavy, super emotional. Um, and finding that video and just sitting there and watching the whole thing and seeing people putting comments into the thread and saying, I love that piece, that's, that's amazing. Because, you know, it's a very niche thing. Rug making also in, in the UK is a very niche thing, even more so than here. So he said it was like just such a strange and surreal moment finding it and watching it in her space while he was kind of taking a break from all the heaviness of going through stuff. Um, and I was so happy that I had recorded that video 
for him to find that, if only for him to find that, for that moment, right? Because for one moment, I was in the studio too, and so were you, if you were on that night making comments and it was going right to him where he needed it, when he needed it. And it's just the universe at work doing great things. So he wrote and he said his mom was um, had written a book that we didn't get here. I don't know the size of it or the breadth of it or anything like that, but um, he said he's going to be sending it to me. That just, it gets me, right? It gets me. Um, he's going to be sending it. So we'll look at that together and see see what there is to see, and we'll, uh, we'll talk more about Diane and her work and find out more. So I'm very happy to not be in touch with him, and that's a big um, sort of question mark, finding out more about his mom and some more of those details so I can cover her in a better way for us here, for posterity, um, you know, just where she needs to be anchored at the top of the of the rug hooking world and very visible for all of us. It was Heidi. It was it was a great message to get. I was really, you know, it was just a few minutes ago. So Crystal says, I'm so glad. Me too. I know. Exactly. Exactly. It was like super, super poignant, you know. Um, anyway, better move on, right? So let's talk about today. <laughs> Choke myself up and then try to move on. Let's talk about uh, Barbara Johnson today. So I've had this book for a while and I love it. I know many people have this book. It is the binding. It's just like the, the Navajo rug book I had the other day. The pages are mostly out. It's more of a portfolio at this point, but it's all in order. So what I did was I started putting together these um, images so we can look at Barbara Johnson's collection. First, let's look at who Barbara Johnson was. This is gonna be a two part today and Wednesday that we'll be talking about this collection because it is important. And not all of Barbara Johnson's rugs are in this book, right? There's more. So I'm in the process of finding some more that are kind of loose on the internet that are, for whatever reason, not in this book. But let me tell you something about her first because she had one of these amazing fairy tale type lives, truly. Let me pull up some pictures. I, I, I kind of started stalking um, yesterday when I got home from teaching. I, you know, I was on the internet and I was, who is Barbara Johnson, right? Um, and I did, I did a bit of stalking, so I, her story was just so amazing. It is truly like a rags to riches Cinderella kind of a story. So this is Barbara Johnson. Now, let me start with her biography. Let me show you some other, a picture maybe that's just of her. There we go. So her name is actually Barbara Piaseca Johnson, and she was born in 1937. She died in 2013. She was a Polish humanitarian, this is Wikipedia, philanthropist, connoisseur of art, and a huge collector. So she is actually from um, Poland, the part that is now Belarus, but um, she, this is rags to riches, like as, as hardcore as it gets. She was born near um, uh, Grodno, Poland, uh, now Belarus. Her dad was a farmer. She graduated from a university there with a master's in art history. And she left Poland in 1968 with $100 in her possession, like to her name. Let me show you another picture of her. This is a sweet one. So this is what we're coming to here, right? So she was hired as a cook by Esther Underwood Johnson, the wife of John Seward Johnson I. Uh, she worked at the Johnsons as a chambermaid. So this is her employer, not the, not Esther, obviously the husband. Um, what happened, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but she really, she really showed a um, love for his, the, him and John and his wife's collection of art, right? So because she had a master's in art too, she was a great art lover. So she is the maid and she is in the house and he apparently she's getting very sort of overpaid because he has so much respect for her for her point of view for her opinions uh for her love of art you know he's obviously quite enamored of her you can see that this story is really going somewhere so as it turns out she personal life let's i'm looking at wikipedia on my phone right now um john seward uh, Johnson engaged in extramarital affairs with Barbara. In 1971, he divorced um, Essie, Esther, who hired her as a chambermaid, um, and he married Barbara. So, as you can imagine, this wasn't super popular in the family. I won't go into that, but you, you, could, you can maybe see why this would not have been 
the, the kids, the existing kids that he had with his wife. Not really for them, right? So um, interesting story. And, you know, in 2007, Johnson was listed, uh, Barbara, on the Forbes 400 World's Richest People list, um, $2.7 billion. And she did a lot of humanitarian work. She did a lot with sending money to Poland. She did a lot in Poland for people financially. So she was, a, it, it, it seems to me that she was a very philanthropic, good person and a great collector of art. So she carried on when her husband passed away. She carried on with a lot of charitable projects. She was not a pig who sat on her money and counted it, right? She did a lot. When he passed away, she continued collecting. Um, she created a school for autistic children, which is, you know, dear to my heart. Uh, contributed to uh, different churches and welfare centers in Poland. She did a lot with this money, but she amassed a really um, stunning and important collection of art that built on what her and her husband already had. So I just want to show you, I took a few more uh, pictures of her to put into the slideshow because I just, when I looked at the rugs, it's great looking at the rugs, but I also just I wanted to look at her, and, and it's it's such a story, isn't it? So, looking so pretty, right, in front of at one of the houses. There's probably more than one house. But what a story. What a whirlwind. Um, I can't imagine how that must have felt. So, doing story, you know, news people interviewing her with all of this, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So, this is where the money is coming from. This is one of the rugs. I'm going to look at the rugs in the book in a minute, but this is one of the rugs that I found that is was in her collection in her lifetime she owned this rug uh, the rugs are now dispersed right but in her lifetime this was hers there's a few i'm going to show you a few more tomorrow i was having because i got involved in the email thing um with jack diane's son um, i didn't have time to load all of the photos but this is one of the ones i found online that i thought was really beautiful that is not in the book and was part of her collection really different it seems like there's a lot of symbolism here and iconography that I can't quite make out. I took it first to be a kind of, not Masonic, but maybe some kind of fraternal order reference, but I can't get there on my own. Maybe you you can shed some light, but I couldn't get there on my own. I had to kind of look at it and say, I see like the Scottish flag, that's a Scottish flag, right? The blue with the cross, like half of the Union Jack. I see a few things that I recognize, but in general, it's a very, very vivid, colorful, graphic rug that I would love to know more about, and there is nothing else on the Dead End uh, Pinterest page where I found it. So, interesting. See if you can shed any light on that for me. Um, this was a picture that's in the book. I just wanted to show you this because this is how her rugs were displayed um, in her lifetime. And, you know, it was curious for me looking at this because obviously it's so thoughtful, the placement of these rugs, the color of these rugs. These are all important rugs, as you can imagine. These are not Hem and Egger rugs. These are not flea market finds. You know, these are, these are important rugs. I mean, maybe some of them were originally. But you can see they're spaced perfectly right at the top on the top tier because this is like, looks like a credence. Oh, no, this is a ceiling. I thought this was looking down. This has got to be a ceiling. On the top left, you can see that really important Magdalena Briner EB rug called the, the zoo or the domestic zoo. But we've looked at that rug, the tall, skinny one, right at 11 o'clock in the picture. Um, so that one moved after her death. And we know that. We've, we covered this in two other episodes of Coffee Time, Cocktail Time. But that's that rug while she was alive in her collection. So super, super um, important. It's cool to exhibit rugs like this uh, in a ceiling format, isn't it? It makes a lot of sense. You, and you can't see the imperfections. You can't see them up close, I guess. That's the only sort of downfall. Oh, and that's Diane. So let me bring you back to the beginning. Let me come back to you here. I'm going to, oh, let me come back to you here. So you know how, wait a minute. I have to, I have to, I have to see you. You know how um, we say this all the time, and maybe this is the summer that I do this. Maybe this is the summer. You know how, if you're like a, a person who likes old cookbooks, for example, or art books or anything, I'm gonna say cookbooks. And let's do this this summer. If you feel like doing this with me, let's do this for one week later in the summer when I come back from vacation. Do you ever open like a cookbook and there's a handwritten recipe in there and it's like somehow out of all the recipes in the book, the one that somebody hand wrote and put in there is the one that you're the most interested in? 
I, I keep saying I want to devote a week of my life to like doing a little blog just once and and only cooking things that I found on sheets and newspaper clippings stuffed into the pages of the book, right? Or in the in the margins of the book. It would be so much fun. Well, this image is one of those. In this Barbara Johnson book, I found this little clipping. It was tucked right into the spine. And let me see if I can read it. I think I took it out and put it as a bookmarker in a different book. Yeah, I did. So, I mean, this, this, this just blows my mind. I'm going to see if I can read what you're looking at here. It's a little old clipping, and I don't know where it came from. Nothing's on it, right? It's clipped real close. This, it says, this is one of the best hooked rugs we've seen in years. From Pennsylvania, the 1890 through 1915 masterpiece is 64 by 38 inches and has as its theme a tree growing out of a double-handled urn with flowers and birds on the branches. It's signed by its maker, Eunice Knott, N-O-T-T, comma, Barbara Ar Ar Artizone of Salisbury, Connecticut, asked $24,000 for it. That's a, that's a substantial amount of money, right? So I'm looking at this rug and I'm thinking, well, it is quite beautiful. Obviously, it's quite, it's quite lovely. 24000 I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But it does say asked past tense. And I'm thinking, what, did somebody buy it? I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Are you in, Dave? Let's do it. Let's do it later in the summer. I, I really want to do it. I think it would be so funny uh, to do that as a project together. Nothing to do with rug hooking, but just fun, right? Um, anyway, I'm going to move on to the photos, but I thought, uh, curious. If you recognize this piece, please let me know because it is, it is a curious thing. Um, $24,000. I don't know. That's a research project that I do not have time for right now, but it is, it is curious. So I'm coming to the images that are now in the body of the book. And the book starts out with, um, let me see what I can tell you. Oh, oh there's a the little clipping. Um, let me tell you this first, right? So the book starts out with kind of an introduction. This is kind of a portfolio style book where it's just showing pieces of art, one piece of art per page, glossy, uh, very fancy limited edition book. You can find this book. It is just called American Classics, Hooked Rugs from the Barbara Johnson Collection. You can find it online. I'm sure there are copies on eBay right now, or there were when I looked yesterday. This was published by the Squibb Gallery in Princeton, New Jersey, um, December of 19... 88, January uh, 1989. So it's going to be a, a limited run. It's finite, right? If you like it and you like what you see, you should try to secure a copy for a reasonable amount of money. I think a reasonable amount of money is under $40, right? That's a, This book costs 30 something for me, and I, that seems to be what it costs. So the introduction starts with uh, a foreword by Richard Furland, who at that time was the chairman and CEO of the Squid Corporate, Squib Corporation. It is Squibb's great pleasure to sponsor this exhibition of hook drugs from the collection of Barbara Johnson. Across the wide spectrum of their content and styles, these rugs are indeed American classics. Singular symbols of the thrift, practicality, and origina originality that helped build our nation. So then it goes into medical supplies and more specific things about Squibb. There's a curator's announcement. I don't, I don't think we need that. I think we're going to know what we're looking at because we're already rug people. Preface. Um, there's all kinds of interesting notes, actually. I may come back to this. Hooked rugs are magical. No matter how simple the rug, it enlivens and enhances. Obviously, a hooked rug will complement its intended setting, the country house. But who would dare to put one into a formal French or English salon? I did. I put a simple American hooked rug on an 18th century Aubusson carpet. The rug nestled and settled into the setting and looked quite natural there. Interesting. So this is going to have been written by, um, yeah, by Barbara herself. Ooh, interesting. I didn't see this before. The first thing she writes is, the first hooked rug I ever bought was Man in Sheep Drawn Cart. Man in Sheep Drawn Cart. You know what? I think, I think that one's on eBay right now. That's one that I saw when I was running last Monday's show that I didn't use. And I didn't use it because I used that other one that had the horse-drawn carriage with the pastel sky and the little boat that I said, is that a submarine, do you remember? There was one quite similar and it was the man in the horse-drawn cart. I'm 90% I'm sure of that. And it's probably still on eBay if you want to check. 
Anyway, that's the first rug that Barbara bought. Not that specific one, of course. It was a commercial pattern. I noticed it at a Sotheby auction preview. Now remember that in the 80s, right, this is pre-eBay, remember when people are turning up hook drugs, there is not so much information as we have now with the internet where we can say, look it, that's a Ralph Burnham commercial pattern, there's no question about that. That's an Edward Sands Frost pattern, there's no question about that. But at that time, finding a rug, we're coming right out of the Joel and Kate Cop era of their collecting, right, in Manhattan, um, and we're working with a lot less information. And Barbara is too. When she's seeing a rug, she's pulling a rug because she can also afford to. And she probably culls her collection many times during the course of the years that she collects because she realizes that there are many categories of quality that she's probably, as we all do as collectors, you hoard everything at first until you sort of fine tune your focus. And then you can look back and say, well, this is definitely less important than that for these 10 reasons. So I think that's probably what she was doing at the beginning of her collecting as well. She said, um, so she found the man in sheep drawn uh, cart from a Sotheby auction and she says, to my surprise, it came in one lot with eight other hooked rugs not listed in the auction catalog. What a dream, God, what a dream, right? Uh, they were very different from one another, but all great. Thus, the collection was born. So she, she bid on the man with the cart and she ended up getting a handful of rugs that were all different. Bonus, um, hooked rugs are more than a warm feeling under someone's foot. They are a warm feeling for the eye. And she wrote, apple pie for the eye. That's a great expression, isn't it? Apple pie for the eye. They convey the spirit of this country as do songs and folk paintings. They are at once artistic and simple, emotive and functional. A woman from New Jersey wrote, after I bought a lifetime of her and her mother's work, quote, this here is Uncle Albert's pants. This was Edward's sweater. Her rugs were the offspring of her art and her thrift. I am lured by these hooked thoughts, hooked feelings. This is a beautiful introduction. Let's return to this tomorrow because she's going to talk about Elsie DeWolf the interior decorator. She's going to go into some other stuff. I just want to kind of scan it before I read it to you. But let's come back to Barbara's own words tomorrow to start tomorrow's episode. Um, and let's look at some of the rugs in the collection. Um, you know, and that just reminds me, I meant to say to you on, on Friday, Joe Conklin, who sometimes comes and hangs out with Jay and I here, he's a hooker too. He's on our Facebook page, which is Rug Cooking and Punch Needle Club. Um, he's a lot of fun. And he was in Hamden, where, where I am this past week, and on Friday he was there, and he shot me a message on Facebook Messenger, and he said, I'm at a, I'm at a yard sale, there's two hook drugs, this is them, do you want them? And I looked at them, and you know I have a lot of rugs at this point, and I'm weeding through stuff. By the way, um, Jay found another box of patterns, so we're gonna photograph those this ap afternoon, and I'm gonna send them to the Patreon people. I'll send you a note this afternoon to tell you what time I'll be posting them tomorrow. All right, so you, you can look at those too if you want. We found a whole other box. So needless to say, I don't just need random rugs, right? I'm culling my collection too, and I only want specific things that speak to me, not necessarily the finest, but the things that fit with the way I'm setting my studio up and my brain works. So I wrote back, um, no, nice rugs, but no thanks. It was like a one eagle and one clipper ship kind of thing. Uh, but the next day, I was driving around and I had the kids out and they wanted to do errands and stuff on the Saturday. And I thought, oh, you know what? I think I'm quite near that yard sale that Joe went to. So I went to the address because it was still on my phone and it was actually an estate sale, not a yard sale. And I completely fell in love with the house. It was one of those things where I walked in and I felt like I had lived there and I knew there was an alcove right here and I knew right here there was a closet. It was the weirdest feeling, but she was a rug hooker. And I guess that was a clue, right? He missed a lot of rugs that were there when he walked through. And I didn't get any of the rugs because none of them were rugs that I needed, right? I probably should have, but it was like half moon welcome rug, uh, Christmas rug, really, really, really worn. But what I did buy was her frame. And it was a fairly new frame. It was just hanging out upstairs on its own. And it's in the car I meant to bring it up to show you. It's not an antique, it is new. So. It seems like this was a woman who had been hooking for many years. She hooked, I mean, I'd be shocked if it was a number three. It looked even smaller than a number three. It looked like angel hair pasta, you know? Tiny, tiny, tiny little strands. But 
in on her frame, I'll show you the piece that she started working on, I guess. That was maybe her last piece. She, she was just adding to the pattern, not actually hooking it yet, drawing onto the pattern. I'll show you tomorrow because it was like a it was like a little house with a moose and she turned the moose into a um, fairly insensitive Native American moose with like a giant uh, headdress kind of thing. And she turned the house into a little log cabin. I'll show you, I'll show you that before I even take it off the frame. And in the body of the frame, on the base of it was like a little shell, right? Like a little open shadow box. And in there, she had a pair of tweezers and a little Tupperware dish with a ton of toothpicks. And I'm guessing what, with her very fine style of hooking, not her hook or anything like that, none of that was there. Because you know it was there, but yeah. And it wasn't there when Joe went, or he would have certainly told me, somebody, whatever, hopefully didn't throw it out. But... Um, I think those toothpicks were because she was she was a super precise sort of like I was saying at the beginning of the episode very sort of old school traditional hooker and she was probably using all those toothpicks tons of them for height for the loops and I thought interesting she's using tweezers and little toothpicks to pull up her little edges I'll show you that frame tomorrow at least I got a piece of her right at least I got a piece of her but yeah I mean this conversation about old school people and hooking in rugs is is eternal. I hope it gives us enough material for coffee time forever and ever and ever. This one is called, or at least referred to, right? These are titles that either Barbara or the, Barbara or the Squib Gallery gave, I don't know. This one is entitled Painterly Square. In other words, it is done in a very painterly manner. It is very artistic, bohemian, painterly. Dated 1870, or no, sorry, date 1870, so we don't know it's not dated. That's the guess at the date. Wool, cotton, and silk rag on burlap with a braided border. Do you see the braided border there? I think it's three, two or three rows of braiding. Really painterly. 40 by 41 made in Pennsylvania. Absolutely beautiful. This is a great example of a very old, original hit or miss pattern where you, you really have absolutely no thought, regard for color planning, for pictures, you're just using your materials to make something warm for the floor. And it is just the sort of ultimate example. I'm not surprised it's the first one shown in the book. Really the ultimate example of a, an original thrifty rug, right? Absolutely beautiful. The first category of rugs that we're looking at in this chapter are geometrics and abstracts. This one is called uh, Ladrilos, um, guesstimate date 1880 wool yarn wool and cotton rag on burlap measures 53 by 41 found on nantucket massachusetts now we know from reading um, the kent books from reading the mcgowan books her histories that this idea for doing this kind of cobblestone and if you've been to nantucket you know a lot of limericks number one and number two you know the whole thing is cobblestone Riding a bike on Nantucket is like uh, is like giving yourself a lobotomy. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba. It's just constant cobblestones. It's not surprising that so many people without a commercial pattern did this kind of geometric design based on brickwork, right? It's not because you would look down under your foot, and this is every road. This is every road until you hit the sand at the beach. So interesting that this would be find out, found on Nantucket. Most interesting about this rug, I think, is that. Um, there is a color plan, which means that there was enough of each color to be able to feel confident about this color plan. And the, and the proper colors reach all the way out to the corners. They, they didn't run out of anything here. Lynn says, this one looks like a quilting pattern trip around the world. Absolutely. It absolutely does look like trip around the world. So all of these are crossover patterns. Anything, right, that you would do on your lap in a hoop with a needle, with a hook, always crossover patterns, this great crossover we've been talking about lately between quilt designs and rug hooking designs, right? They are really the same thing. So interchangeable. It's just so, so pretty. Uh, we see a lot of this, but we don't see a lot of this with the kind of cohesive color uh, planning that is happening here. We see a lot of running out. This one is just golden right has been executed you can feel the satisfaction of the person who made it you can still feel their satisfaction hooking those last corner like little rusty brown corner bricks going whoo I made it I had enough uh, sigh of relief right and you see there's a little bit of color variation but they've still done that in a geometric way they were very very careful can you imagine what this looked like as right the shading Aileen as they were hooking it 
they were it looks like they were doing equal shading or at least the outline on each brick component and then going back to it so i would have loved to have seen this in the making it was probably the whole surface of it covered with a little bit everywhere and then going back in order putting a little bit more right because they knew, they didn't have enough to do full blocks of each color but they did the same sort of salmon and red and then the brown with the rust and the dove gray with the dark gray they did that and you can see them just filling it all a little bit and then going okay i think i have enough for another round for each brick right i think i'm going to make it and then changing to another color that's quite similar but how exciting how exciting to have made it right now this is a piece i'm sure we've seen before all of these antique rugs of course are copyright free right the the uh, people who made them and designed them have have been gone for more than 50 years certainly the estimated date on this one that is referred to as blue sam um, this was actually owned by andy warhol this was in his collection originally uh, the date on this guesstimate 1875 this is 41 by 34 found in new york wool cotton and silk rag on burlap this is an interesting one because it's, a, it's something of a sampler. Beautiful heart motif in the center, got a diamond motif going around part of it, and then the person kind of started experimenting with lamb's tongues or a variation on a lamb's tongue. So it's almost as if um, they realized maybe that there was no, not enough solid color to keep going with the diamonds, and they just switched to a hit or miss pattern. Um, but it works beautifully with both. It, it takes on the look of a sampler. It looks like um, the opposite of the last rug we saw. It looks like you can almost hear someone say, dang it, I'm out of blue. What am I going to do now? I don't have enough of any color. And then going, oh, wait a minute. Well, the neighbor was doing something with the scallops where they were just going around in concentric circles. Maybe I'll just do that. And then that worked out, didn't it? And it worked out great because it's a great example of thrift in these original rugs. Now this one is a design. Uh, Tara's not on today, but when she's on, she just did a design like this on her table in her house with a glass. I have this image upside down. I'm sorry about that. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but normally um, like the scallops or the tongues are going upward. But beautiful, another kind of a hit or miss design. This is called Cobblestones, dates to around 1920, wool on burlap, uh, wool crocheted border. So the crocheted border that we're seeing people like my good buddy, Mary Jo Taylor doing at uh, Northwest Folk Design, she's doing a lot of crocheted borders lately. Crocheted borders are not new. We saw a crocheted border last Monday when we were looking at the eBay rugs that were current, right? We saw a beautiful crocheted border there. Um, so the idea of mixing media and mediums is a very old idea. We went really pedal to the floor pure rug hooking since the McGowan era. And I think now we're starting to kind of crack the spine open on that old book and say, well, listen, if it's a textile, doesn't crochet also go with rug making? And doesn't quilting also go with rug making? And the answer is, of course they do. Of course they all go together. Uh, back in the day, people knew how to mash it up, right? We kind of uh, marginalized everything later, but it all does go together. So beautiful rug with two different techniques present. Real hit or miss. You can see some real standout fabrics in here. There's some beautiful, soft, I'm sure faded solids. But I mean, you can see there are some real, at the top of the image here, knowing it's upside down, there's a little bit of color blocking where some colors run out on some of those very tippity top scallops. But coming down to the yellow with the black, what an unusual tweed that must have been. I can see what looks like some black watch in here. Um, when you use these patterned wools like plaids and you do this kind of design, you end up with something that looks like marbled paper, don't you? I mean, really something. Oh, Jennifer, I didn't know Andy Warhol collected rugs. I think he collected a little of everything. And that last rug, let's look at it one more time, certainly has a pop art feel to it. I think all of the early rugs that we're looking at have a pop art feel, but this one is very symbol driven, isn't it? Compared to, for example, the cobblestones. So it's easy to see how he would be attracted to this rug because he was very symbol driven in his work. And this is, um, this is a composition based on a repeat, which we know that was something that he also liked very much. So cobblestones, super, super, super fine, and certainly done. I'm gonna say certainly done 
with a glass or a plate or sauce or something like that. What's the measurement? 47.75 by 38.5. Could have been could have been a glass or a teacup or something like that. Just pushing it along and lining it up with your with your lines of the grain, right? To get it nice and even like that. This is certainly something that would have been in the wheelhouse of many housewives, right? For us now, we would we would stand looking blankly at the blank backing and go, oh my God, how am I ever going to make this thing even? But for them, back at this time, it would have been a no-brainer. They would have just bowled as brass, taken out some kind of writing utensil or piece of charcoal and just got, got busy with it, right? I do two cats gallery. I love the hearts. This one, I think, is extraordinary. 1860, this is called a sauna. Uh, cotton and wool on burlap, 98 by 84 point quarter, quarter. Uh, also from Nantucket, Mass. Um, and the note on this one is that rugs this early and this large are rarely found. Well, I'll say 1860 is about as early a date as we ever get with rug hooking before we start to wonder if it was actually sewn and not hooked. 1860 is about it. That is like, that is the basement floor of, of the year that we've put uh, to rug hooking, right? To the rug hooking timeline. So this could be way at the beginning, certainly. Um, this is just extraordinary because, again, right, there's a reason why these fine ones, knowing that Barbara had other rugs as well, there's a reason why these fine ones appear in this catalog, um, the Squib catalog, because it's these are extraordinary. These are museum examples. A lot of black and a lot of the ivory, right? It's worked. And then a lot of that, like red, the sort of center on these flowers, it's just a repeat. It ends up looking like a plaid or a gingham but it is tipped, right? It's not top to bottom, it's sort of diagonal. It is tipped a little bit, Sally says. He will look, happy, he will look happiest hooking community in YouTube. <laughs> um, I like the way that it is off center. It gives it a great, it gives it a great design. And then using all the same direction, the hit or miss stripies on every other block, that really is great, isn't it? It really, really is a good piece. <coughs> massively large piece really extraordinary color wise to pull this off I mean th this is a lot of material isn't it it makes you wonder how this person um, on Nantucket got this much material um, of the same color I mean yes it's black and white but it's it's a lot that's a huge rug that's a huge quantity it is beautifully and expertly done this is a great exceptional early rug isn't it this is another real beauty. A little bit later, 1880, cotton and wool rag rug. This is called crossed arrows for obvious reasons. 40 by 36. None of these are small rugs. This one is found in New York. Now, this is a great idea for a rug. Um, simple design, really simple. And yeah, crossed arrows, but it also, for me, has the look of um, like a compass. What's that? Oh. Jay, what's that? Are you on the phone? No, no. What's that thing that mariners have that is like a, uh, it, it doesn't tip, right? Because it's like on the water and the arrow is on it. It's like a directional. You know what I mean? Binnacle. Binnacle. Maybe I'm thinking of a binnacle. It's got, it, for me, it's this the rug. Compass. It's the whole, the compass. Yeah. No, not the compass rose because that, that's a good one, but that's always round, no. right? Yeah. This is like, this just reminds me of that uh, instrument that mariners used um, with the arrows that, you know, um, weren't affected by the motion of the waves on the boat. I, I think it might be binnacle. I think that might be. Yeah, well, no, the binnacle was no. to hold it the compass. Now it's we're going like, crazy. That's the binnacle. No, not the binnacle. You're talking the thing that you look yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. It's a still, it's called a compass, I believe. Could be a compass. I thought it had a more fancy name. Maybe not. Maybe I dreamt it. But anyway, this reminds me, not so much of arrows, but of that sort of nautical reference, right? Barometer. Maybe barometer. Maybe that is what I'm thinking. Barometer tells the... The um, pressure, the air yeah, pressure or something? Yeah. I'm, You know, I'm probably crossing wires, everyone. I don't have any knowledge of the sea. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. This looks like a nautical reference to me more than anything, but it is called crossed arrows. Also like a bit of a windmill, isn't it? It really is a beautiful design. When you sit and look at that blank backing like we were just saying, you know, sometimes it's hard to think of ideas. What a simple idea this is. What an excellent opportunity for color play. Look at the just color, the alternate color choices in that center block. 
one of the sort of arrow centers is white, the other one is black, that little repetition of the rusty red in the middle, and then that wild geometric hit or miss around the sides. This is so resolved as a composition, right? Every line resolves itself really, really effective almost a square, uh, limited colors, absolutely beautiful. You can see this being on the floor of an old house. You could see a nice coffee table over it with a glass top that you can look right down onto that central motif. How beautiful would that be? I mean, it belongs up on the wall, obviously, but um, no, Aileen, I liked barometer. I, li I think that is what I was thinking, but it isn't what I mean. It's just, I don't have enough good words for this, but beautiful, beautiful example. These are all beautiful examples. That's why they're in this collection, right? So this is what I used as a thumbnail. Reflections in red and blue. This is the cover design. 1910 wool rag on burlap, 48 by 31, found in Indiana. Um, this was used in 1984 uh, in House and Garden magazine. The September issue, page 184, in case you have that. So this has been seen. This book includes to the year of the publishing, obviously all of the instances when these rugs had been used or published in different periodicals. So that's important to note too, because once this has appeared in a magazine, it gives it a bit more prestige, doesn't it? I mean, it gives it a bit more pedigree and provenance and all of that stuff. Binnacle compass, maybe, maybe. These all feel right to me. They all feel like a yes. Um, but this one is really unusual because it has that kind of saw, it's 1910, right? So we're, we're just heading into out of the Edwardian period into the sort of uh, Art Deco period in the US. It has a bit of a window feel. It's heading toward that kind of optical art escher. But what it really looks like to me is a stained glass window that's kind of stretched, just pulling lines and stretching them up and coming up with a very simple geometric. You do your lines, right? Or look at some Sextant. kind of, what is it? Sextant. Sextant, that's what I was thinking. You are right. That is exactly what I was thinking. I Sextant. Know. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All those, yeah, metal Maybe. crossing parts. Uh huh. Me too. <laughs> um, yeah, this is just a beautiful design. Oh, good morning, Cindy. So, you know, again, sitting there looking at your blank canvas, these are not commercial designs. So far, these are not commercial designs. Think about lines. This is a fold it in half job, isn't it? Think about, this is just like the top of a window at a church. You just draw these lines, you draw the shadow lines under it, and then there's just a box with an inner frame in every compartment. It's a super simple design. If you have any sort of ornate windows in your house or in a building in the center of your town, take a walk and just draw a window that you see, photograph a window that you see, and do it like this. See what your composition comes out like. It's such an easy composition to execute, right? This would be a lot of fun to just take a walk together, take some pictures of windows, and, and handle them like this. It comes out to be a beautiful abstract and meaningful if it's off a special building, right? Something that you found out there. Beautiful composition. This piece is called Minaret. Dates to 1930, squarely in the deco period again. Wool on burlap, all wool. 67 by 34, found in Ohio. Um, what a beautiful composition. This is for 1930, right? Think about this period, particularly in this part of the country. Um, very colorful, very cheerful, right? These were all scanned, so sorry about the lack of focus on the right, but beautiful, colorful rainbow diamonds going around the edge. Lots of color spectrum right in the center. Really, really beautiful. A little bit of variation with this cartoon like adding to some of these borders. Just a simple composition. This is like that style that you sometimes see in books. I know we've talked about it. This is what I would think about. I'm going to come back as the ink blot style, right? So this is something that they did in art class in like the 60s, 70s, all the time. Maybe you did it in class. We didn't do it at Catholic school because the nuns did not like messes. But I was aware of the technique where people would take, you know, you do it at home at someone else's house. The neighbor mom did this a lot. She'd give us a piece of paper and she'd let us drop a little bit of ink in because then I had all this kind of Windsor and Newton ink that came in bottles. And I'd take the little stopper and I would drop like some little dots of ink and then I'd shut the book like this and then do like this and then open it and you've got this symmetrical, beautiful ink blot drawn. And then we would put them outside to dry and then bring them back in when they were dry and figure out what we thought the thing looked like. 
and start adding to the picture. You know, this looks like a whale coming out of the water. This is maybe like a boat in the background or a dragon cloud or something. And that was a game that people did a lot in art class. That's what this piece really reminds me of. It is super lovely. It's like an ink blot design with a with a horizontal um, fold, right? Just one blot and then radiated out of it just layer after layer after layer. All of that nice round shapiness, but then to, to, to contain all of that nice roundness and color, this very sort of severe geometric border, but still whimsical, right? We're gonna put a black border on this to shape this out, and yet let's, let's repeat those lovely, colorful, jewel-like rainbow gems around the edge as a repeat. In the center, it almost has a bit of that Navajo feel, doesn't it? Just a little bit. Really different, very different rug, minaret. Uh, there's a note on this one that says, a hand-operated cutter invented around 1875 to enable the simultaneous cutting of several strips of fabric um, as fine as 3 30 seconds of an inch may have been used for this rug. So interesting, that's a may have been used. That is really, <laughs> um, could be, you know, we'd have to look at it a lot closer and this is what we get in this book, right? So it would be real interesting to be able to look at this one up close. I don't know what the fate of a lot of these rugs are. We do know the Magdalena changed hands twice since, since this. Um, but it would be a rabbit's hole, if anybody has the time or the interest, it would be a rabbit's hole to follow up research-wise with where all these rugs are at. Um, I have not, wait a minute, sorry. Oop, bad things, bad things. There we go. This is like a centerfold, and again, glare. These are all glossy pictures in here. Um, this, so yeah, not all of this is the image. Your eye can, I'm sure, um, de define where the rug is and where the glare is. But this is a beautiful repeat pattern. This is known as clouds. Dates to about 1880. Woolen cotton rug on burlap, 60 and a half by 32 and a half. Uh, it was purchased in New York. It was of the Howard and Jean Lipman collection. We have talked about them as well as collectors. This was used in 1982 in Money Magazine, the June issue, page 145. Really stunning um, repeat pattern, right? Really stunning. Um, excellent use of different colors, white outlining, very unusual for this period. Does have the look of kind of a tapestry, the pulled or drawn threads, right? But in this case, it's wool and it's hooked. But you know what I mean, that sort of pulling pieces from one color to the next through that motif that almost looks like glass because of the white outline. Very abstract, right? Very before its time, in my opinion. This could easily be a 1930s rug, brand new, but it's not. They're calling it an 1880s rug, and they, they would know. So a little bit of patterned material, mixed material, a little bit of hit or missing it out, right? Um, I'm reading your comments, too. Um, absolutely beautiful. Very masculine color palette, traditionally ma masculine, right? Really, what, what saves this rug with this unidentifiable repeat pattern? Somebody obviously drew something possibly from a piece of fretwork, right? It looks like it could easily be a piece of fretwork. Maybe something that someone kind of jigsawed to make bookends or something like that. Somebody had some kind of a template. Maybe they just drew it on a piece of paper. Somebody had some kind of a template and they figured out if they butted them up top to bottom that they could make a repeat pattern. And that in making this repeat pattern, there would be by default a negative, right? So in between you see that weird squiggly thing that looks kind of like a bat or a viking, right? That is the negative of the repeat of the template. So somebody figured out, ooh, this is kind of like early optical art. This is working. It's going to leave me with the pattern, with the negative pattern, where I can add some different colors. And whoever made this rug had the built-in color sense to know that there had to be contrast to make these lines work because these lines are not recognizable as a shape. And when they're not, you can have a pig's breakfast. But in this case, this person was very careful to outline with the white, use white in just the right places so that we would be able to see where these great divides are between the negative and the positive, right? And it isn't co completely and purely abstracted because the color breakdown is super thoughtful. They've broke it down at the half, 
of every template mark, right? Halfway through, they change the colors significantly from brown to blue. It's almost like they also understood how the color wheel worked. This is really smart color placement. It would be very hard to sit down and do this or color plan this. You have to, you have to have this built in or have somebody that has a great working knowledge of the color wheel standing over your shoulder to be able to execute this kind of design. This is not for the weak of heart. This is really, really uh, a complex and complicated design. I want to get to, let me get to, um, no, you know what? I'm going to leave it there because we did our thumbnail. We did our thumb. I'm going to leave it there so when we log on on Wednesday, we know that that centerfold uh, is the one that we ended with. I'm going to use my little bookmarker from the beginning to mark our place. So we have a bunch more that we can look at on Wednesday. As we get toward the end, because we're still in abstracts and geometrics, as we get toward the end, you will be surprised because you will, with our vast knowledge of rug cooking now after all these episodes, you will recognize some of the patterns that we will see on Wednesday. There are commercial patterns there. And it does make me wonder, did she know they were commercial patterns when she bought them? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, but we know now that they are. With so much pooled knowledge and, and the internet as a resource, we have a lot to work with, um, unlike the 1980s. So we will come back to all that on Wednesday. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Maybe there'll be more news. Maybe there'll be new excitement and things that happen between now and then. But I will be back to you on Wednesday. And um, if you need me in the meantime, ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. I feel like there's something else I've got to tell you. Be looking out on Ribbon Candy Hooking. I've put up the um, this class, uh, which is a Zoom class for beginners or for anybody who wants to take it with directional hooking with 1985 cat. I'll try to get the, um, the Songs of a Summer Night up tonight. The Prim swatch collection or any of these colors are also available um, individually in um, any, well, starting with quarter yard and up, right? So all of this is back in stock. I'm making sure everything is stocked up. And um, yeah, a bunch of new things appeared on the website this weekend, I think. So always worth taking a look, trying to, trying to keep things going and chugging along nicely. And I do have a bit more big news for you, but I'm just going to wait a day or two more before I tell you, not to keep you in suspense or anything, but exciting stuff. And I just want to firm everything up. Um, but lots of stuff going on on this end, and it's all fun. It involves all of us, so lots of things to look forward to. I will see you on Wednesday at noon, same time, Ribbon Candy Hooking Channel, and we will continue looking at Barbara Johnson's collection, and I will continue searching for rugs on the Internet. There were at one time part of her collection.